Isn't God good? Amen. This word that I have tonight, um, when I prayed for 2024 and asked God what the word was for 2024 for me, and he said, expectation. Well, there's, there's godly expectation and there's ungodly expectation. And I never really thought of that until, you know, I started praying about the message. And that's the way God started it out was the ungodly expectation. So the, the name of this message is, Where Are Your Expectations? I'd just like to open up with a word of prayer. Lord, I just ask the Holy Spirit to take over right now, take over my heart, my mind, my mouth. Holy Spirit, you speak and penetrate the hearts of the listeners. Open their ears to hear what you have to say in Jesus' mighty name. You know, when when ungodly expectations start, it started quick. It actually started before Adam and Eve were ever on the earth. Joe, could you pull up uh, Luke 10, 18? Jesus replied, while you were ministering, I watched Satan topple until he fell suddenly from heaven like lightning to the ground. Satan's expectation was that he was going to be equal with God. His expectations didn't work out very well for him, did they? His expectations got him where he's going to be in a pit for the eternity. So the angels were created before Adam and Eve. So, so Satan had to have fell before Adam and Eve. Now that could have been months. That could have been years. The Bible doesn't let us know exactly how long before Satan fell. But he fell and he took a third of the angels with him. He expected to be equal with God. Nothing can be equal with God. Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, that's it. No man, no nothing will ever be equal with him. Amen? Joe, pull up uh, Genesis 11. Start at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us let lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. They begin to do. So they already started s slipping away right there that they begin to do. That they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them, from them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So they expected that they were going to build them a tower that would reach 
God reach heaven. It's, it's one of the bad expectations. So basically, they were putting themselves just like Satan did, wanting to make themselves equal with God. Like I said, there's only one God. It doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to be equal with God. God is a supreme being. He's the only one. Amen? So what they received? They didn't want to be scattered. But when they started building that city and they built that tower, they got scattered. Everyone had different languages. Nobody could understand anybody. And then he sent them out along their way. So if your expectations aren't meeting God's will and his word, it's the wrong expectation. Expectations ought to come from your heart toward God and what his word says or what his will is. That's where your expectations need to be. Joe, let's go to uh, Acts 8 1. Everybody knows the, the story of Saul. Now, Saul agreed to be an accomplice to Stephen's stoning and participated in his execution. From that day on, a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem began. All the believers scattered into the countryside of Judea and among the Samaritans, except the apostles who remain, remained behind Jerusalem. God-fearing men gave Stephen a proper burial and mourned greatly over his death. Then Saul mercilessly persecuted the church of God, going from one house to house into the homes of believers to arrest both men and women and drag them off to prison. So when Saul was Saul, he had an expectation. He wanted to have every believer of Jesus thrown in prison or murdered. Now, he didn't get his, everything I've read, he doesn't get his hands dirty as far as the murder. But he has it done. So his expectation was there wasn't going to be any believers you believed in Jesus, you were going to go to prison. You weren't going to get out. That's the ungodly expectation. But God. Let's go to Acts 9-1. During those days, Saul, full of angry threats and rage, wanted to murder the disciples of the Lord Jesus. So he went to ask the high priest, and requested a letter of authorization he could take to the Jewish leaders in Damascus, requesting their cooperation in finding and arresting any who were followers of the way. Saul wanted to capture all of the believers he found, both men and women, and drag them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So he obtained the authorization and left for Damascus. Just outside the city, a brilliant light flashing from heaven suddenly exploded all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a, a booming voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The men accompanying Saul were stunned and speechless, for they heard heavenly voice but could see no one. Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, the victorious the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city where you will be told what you are to do. Saul stood to his feet, and even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He was blind, so the men had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. So Saul's expectations after this completely, just 180. Saul wanted to go save get everybody saved and following Jesus. He wanted to disciple everyone that he come across. He wanted to know who saved his life, who brought him out of death and into life. So his expectations just flipped. 
Amen? I might not have been a, a, a Saul as far as what Saul did, but I was a Saul. I was the other 180 of where I'm at today. But my expectation changed when, get, when God breathed on me. When his Holy Spirit led me, started tugging at my heart, come this way, come this way, out of the darkness, out of the darkness, into God's glorious light. Amen. I want to talk about a special man. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sakah, which belongs to Ju Judah. They encamped between Sakah and Azekah in Ephesus Dam. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from, Gai from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And I looked that up to see how tall that is. That's nine foot nine inches. That's a big guy. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And I looked that up. That's 126 pounds. Just that. And he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. 600 shekels. So the spearhead alone weighed 15 pounds. So this is a big guy. Let's go to uh, verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistines and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first one did. So everyone treated David like a kid because David was a kid. They didn't want to hear nothing that he basically had to say. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. So you have all these grown men that don't want nothing to do with Goliath. They take off. They start running the other direction. And then you got a teenage boy. Exactly what age he is, I don't know, but he's teenaged. That's what they say. That's willing to go out and take on Goliath. Amen. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. 
But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. So David had an expectation as a young man. There wasn't nothing going to harm what God had given him. Those sheep, they might have been his dad's, but God gave them to him. And he would go out, lion, bear, didn't matter to him. This is a teenage boy. You have to have some expectation and faith to go out and fight a bear and a lion with your hands. I mean, if I was to do that and I wasn't in God, I'd be gone. You know, that'd take me out. Slap me down, eat me, whatever. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hands of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and let the Lord be with you. So he had the expectation, didn't matter if this guy was nine foot nine, didn't matter that he was wearing all this armor, he was going to take three stones and he was going to kill him. And that's exactly what happened. So the question is, what's your expectations? Are they, are they godly expectations? Do they line up with his word? Do they line up with his will? Or do you have expectations that aren't that great? They're fleshly. New house. You know, I expect to have a new house. I expect to have a new car. Uh, I expect to have the most beautiful wife when I get married. Not to say that that's bad. But those expectations ought to be lining up with what? The word of God says. I, you know, God God had me start speaking my expectations at the last of November. And I'll just give you my top five. I expect that me and Jill's bodies will be completely healed in 2024. From the top of our head to the soles of our feet. I expect to see God's glory in a way that I've never experienced. I expect to see the Holy Spirit move in ways that I've never seen. I expect the young couples to go out and win hundreds of souls in 2024. My other, my last one on my top five, I've got more. My last one on the top five is when people walk through that door, no man, no woman lays a hand on them. But the Holy Spirit, as soon as they walk through that door, instantly healed. Instantly healed. Set free, delivered, and on fire to serve God. We have to have those type of expectations. 2024, if you're not serving God, it's not going to be a good year for you. It's just really, it's not. There's some things that are going to happen in 2024 that's not going to be good. There'll be things that we haven't seen yet. What we need to be is ready and expecting people to walk through that door looking for somebody to lead them to Jesus. Amen? You know, that's what Jared's just been on my heart for since November, actually. And it's because out of the doors, going out of the doors, it's easy to come in here and do it. It's when you go out there in the streets, in the highways, in the byways, and you're witnessing to people, and you're telling them about Jesus. You're showing them the love of Jesus. 
you're leading them to Christ. So he's had me pray for that couple and the young couples for going on two months now, every day. Every day. I want to see those souls come through the door. I expect it. I expect it. I expect everyone in here that you're anointing, you're anointing to increase in 2024. That you won't even recognize yourself. Amen? Those are the expectations that I have. God's changed my, I mean, he just flipped me around in November. Well, actually, I guess it was October, 1st of November. Flipped me around. I don't even recognize myself. I really don't. That's how radically he's changed me. And that's when he's that's when he started giving me the expectations. What what do you want? You know? What are you expecting? And he told me, don't put limits on them. Don't put limits on them. God's a lot bigger than we even can think of or no. So when he tells you don't put no lemon on it, imagine what he can do in your life. Amen. If you're getting in that pool tonight, expect whatever it is that you need. If it's deliverance, if it's healing, whatever it is, expect that once you go in that water and you come up, whatever it is you need, God's going to meet that need. Amen. I'd just like to thank you guys for uh, listening. I'd like to thank Pastor Tim for allowing me to come up here and speak. And uh, I'm expecting some great things for 2024. That's a good word right there. What are you expecting? What did he, I think he told, is it blind Bartimaeus? What do you want me to do for you? Well, you'd think it was obvious, but he wanted him to specify it. What do you want me to do? Do you believe I'm able to do this? Come on, there are two questions I'm, that the Lord is asking tonight. What do you want me to do for you? And do you believe I'm able to do this? Because faith, come on, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And by faith, God's a, God answers your being unto you according to your faith. So God's going to respond to your expectation. Amen? I'm just telling you, that's a powerful word. You have got to, he says, uh, if you waver, so let not, let, let not that person think they'll receive anything from God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a what? A rewarder for those that diligently seek him. So God honors faith. And you know what? That's kind of your limitation. Whatever you believe God for, you can receive. Right? Come on. If you're believing it lines up with the will of God, the plan of God, it's, come on, there's a lot of promises, and they're all awesome, and they're all good, and they're all yours. But you know what? You tap into them. Through faith and patience, we receive the promises. Someone say, through faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. Now, what I wanted to just share before we go into testimonies, and we are going to take up a quick offering here in a minute so we can get that ready. Um, but action releases God's power. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, so he would say, stretch out your hand, right? Or take up your bed and walk. So there was action involved. Come on, faith, love without works is dead. But I want you to know that faith without action is dead. You believe that? Come on, if you believe, we believe, therefore we what? Speak. We believe, therefore we step out and, and we, we do what we do by faith. So getting in this water tonight is an action step. It says, I believe God enough to get in this water. And I don't know if your faith is a little mustard seed. And you might be like the man with the, with the boy that says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And God healed that person. Come on. He said, I believe. I'm, I'm hanging on. But there's a battle going on inside of me. But, Lord, I am reaching out to you right now. I'm believing you. I'm trusting you. And I don't know what, you, what your need is tonight. Whether it's healing or, or deliverance, but I'm telling you, take a step of faith. 
and say, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. And action, I believe this, action releases God's power. And we, by getting in these waters. And I'm going to give some, we're going to, um, if you want to pass the buckets around, if you want to give tonight, you're, you're, you're definitely welcome to. I'm going to um, have Jubal come up. And Jubal, if you want to just, let's give her a big God bless you. And I'm going to have her share her testimony. And then I'm going to show some pictures. You want me to show the pictures first or later? It don't matter. Oh. Okay. Hi, my name is Jubal. I'm from uh, Joplin, so that's why you probably don't recognize me. But, um, so my testimony, I have a healing testimony. That's my neck in July, I believe. I was diagnosed with psoriasis at the age of 11. Um, and these are cases when it was more severe, but the more I pursued God and the more I started chasing after him, which I only started the January last year, so it's coming up on a year. But um, whenever I was worldly and I was so in the world, it was not nearly as bad as these pictures. Um, but, yeah. All right, so in October, um, wait, can you go back to that last picture? Yeah, that picture, I had just given up a seven-year nicotine addiction. Um, and I woke up like that. Like, I, th I gave up nicotine, and then immediately it was like all fire came down on me. Um, but, yeah. And then uh, in October, I went to the North Georgia Revival, and it was a, it was the pastors and leaders. Yeah. And it, uh, it didn't look like that when I was there. It was still, it was still visible, but it wasn't nearly as bad. But um, I... There was a lady there that had gotten healed of a gluten allergy. And at the time, I thought that that's what it was. And I was trying to, like, just figure out what was going on in my body because it was it was so spiritual. Uh, but I thought it was a gluten allergy. And this lady got healed, like, significantly. And she was in the water. And Pastor Marty, he called everyone up who had a similar situation to her. We, I was in line to get in the water, actually, when he called everyone up to go there. And I was, like, about to lose my place in line. And I was, and, and when I heard that, I was, like, I ran so fast up to that <laughs> baptismal pool expecting to get healed. Like, I ran up there with expectation. And it was, it, I felt like we sat there for a minute with our hands lifted, and I was just, like, soaking it in. And I felt like um, – when your foot's asleep and it's tingling and you can't really feel it and it's numb, it was like that on the back of my neck, and I've never felt that before. It was the weirdest feeling I've ever experienced, but uh, that was after. And I got in the water that night. I got my place back in line. But uh, when I got in the water, the Lord not only healed my neck, but he started a, a heart healing that night. And then, um, yeah, it was really awesome. And I didn't even realize I got healed until I was so distracted. There was so much spiritual warfare. But the Lord took the, my skin and he wiped it clean. It was amazing. Come on, let's give her a big God bless you. Isn't that awesome? My goodness. Didn't know she was healed. Has that ever happened to anybody else? You didn't know you was healed until you realized you woke up and like something's changed. I've, I've, I've experienced that. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking if Cole's not here tonight, but I know his mom's here. And I don't know if I can put her on the spot and see if you, would you mind sharing Cole's testimony? You probably don't know it better than I do. Or do you want me to share it? If I mess up. So Cole came here, I don't know, it's been a little over a year ago, I believe. 
course, we had the big, we just emptied the big pool because it's a little bit too hard to heat. So it's not the pool, it's Jesus, right? So we got water. Expectation. Cole had severe, I mean, so severe headaches that it would, he'd actually pass out from the headaches. It was disabilitating. And he'd had them, I want to say, for 10 years at least, maybe once or twice or three times a week. Yeah. And somehow he'd heard about what Jesus was doing in the water. He came here. Oh, he actually, he was going to come here. And right about the time he was going to come, guess what happened? He had a headache. Called his mom. And I think he even called you guys. said, I can't come. One of these headaches are coming on. Who knows what it's going to look like. It's going to be bad. But he felt like he heard God say, go anyway. And somehow he made it here. I want you to know, his life was in, in shambles. But Jesus, he got in the water, got saved, delivered, and healed. And from all anxiety, every headache instantly left. He told me that I've heard this story two or three times, from just me and him visiting. Instantly left, and it has never come back. Come on, that's Jesus. Come on, that was a demonic spirit that was afflicting him and in the kingdom of darkness, and it was the devil trying to just destroy his life and wear him out. And God said, it's over. Jesus sets you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? And I just, there's, I want to, we could go into stories and stories and stories. I'm thinking of, of Scotty, who has an ADHD. He got in the water, and all of a sudden he found out he could read his Bible and understand it, and he was set free from uh, whatever it was, he was was tormenting him. He, I guess was he was diagnosed with just having trouble concentrating and and comprehending things. God just healed his mind, and it's just there's there's so many people that have been healed and touched. Sarah, her, you know, you, everyone knows Sarah's story. Blind since birth, legally blind, no peripheral vision. Gets in the water, comes up out of the water, and she knows something shifted. For the first time in her life, she could see people on both sides of her. Never had seen that before. Legally blind on a, on a full disability scholarship to college. Her, her doctor, her mom's doctor, wanted her to be aborted. Wanted her to be aborted because of all the complications they knew was coming to this little baby. And, and Sherry said, no. Terry said, no, we're not going to abort her. And they had her. And she was born legally blind. Complications. But she got in the water. Jesus healed her heart, healed her body, and changed her life. And she'll never be the same. Come on, that, that, I, I, I'd venture to say that testimony, because I know Todd has shared this wherever he goes. He shared it a lot. And uh, her testimony, testimony probably went around the world in, to a certain extent. I mean, probably millions upon millions have heard her testimony. And she, went to, she flew to South Carolina, was on the Sid Roth Network. And uh, wow, what a what a story from little old Benita in a little pool of water where Jesus showed up and somebody had some expectation. Somebody decided, you know what, if he could do it for you, maybe. No, not maybe he'll do, He's no respecter. He'll do it for me. If, if I'll just grab a hold of his garment, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. And if that's you tonight, if you just say, look, I'm going to touch Jesus. I'm going to get in that water, and things are going to break. Things are going to change, and I'm going to leave here totally different. If you believe that, I need you to go ahead, and uh, we're going to get ready to start baptizing. I need some music on upstairs.